The parable of the raft is perhaps the most famous of the Buddha's early parables. It's a particularly Buddhist, I think, way of understanding the world. And we're going to get into that in today's video. But be before I begin, though, I want to give a, just a very quick nutshell version of the uh, parable of the raft in case you're not familiar with it. In a quick nutshell, the idea is that the Dharma, that is the Buddha's teaching, is like a raft. It's for crossing over, crossing over the stream of samsara to get to the farther shore of enlightenment, of nirvana. It's not for holding on to. In other words, it's like a raft. It is something that we make use of for a particular purpose. And then when we're done with it, when we've reached nirvana, we can leave it behind on the shore and don't carry it around with us. That's sort of how we come to understand this, this parable, I think, most of us. It's how it's come to us nowadays, and it's, that's a perfectly, a perfectly good sort of first understanding. But what I want to do in today's video is to get a little bit more into the context of that parable, where it occurs in the early teachings, so as to give it a bit more flavor so we can understand, I think, in more depth and detail what the Buddha is really getting at here. The parable of the raft occurs in one of the densest and most profound of the early suttas, a sutta that is called the Sutta on the, the Snake. And it's called that because there is another parable, another simile in that sutta which involves a snake. And we're going to get to that in a moment because that parable actually comes right before the parable of the raft and in fact feeds into it. So as we're going to see, there's kind of a progression here. This sutta on the, the snake uh, begins with a monastic, a monk, named Aritta, who has taken on a belief, has a belief, that is incorrect. And the, the Buddha and indeed the other monastics are concerned with Aritta's belief and are trying to disabuse him of this belief. Now, in the sutta, all that we hear about is the belief itself. That is, that, that Aritta, this monastic, has a belief that uh, basically the pursuit of sensual pleasures are not obstructive of attaining nirvana. That is to say, one can achieve, one can pursue all sensual pleasures, including um, sexual pleasures. In other words, he's a monastic, he's supposed to be celibate, but he believes that he doesn't have to be because he believes that he can have a full, a full life, including all these sensual pleasures while pursuing enlightenment. Now, it seems that Aritta is what we might term a sort of a Buddhist sophist. Now, sophist is a, is a Western term. It comes from uh, ancient Greece, in the, among the Greek, Greek philosophers. And a sophist is basically somebody who reasons with very clever arguments that are fallacious, that are incorrect, that lead us to the wrong answers. And, you know, he's so, somebody like a, a good lawyer who sort of understands the positions of everybody around him and is able to uh, uh, use these clever, cl clever arguments to get himself to positions that are incorrect but that seem on the face of it to be uh, somewhat uh, persuasive. Now, as a matter of fact, in this sutta, we only have Aritta's conclusions. That is, as I say, that that monastics like him, and he in particular, can pursue any sexual, sensual pleasure he would like, and it's not going to obstruct his, his, uh, his search for enlightenment. It's not going to obstruct his path to enlightenment. That's his conclusion. Uh, but what is his argument? Now, it, it, there's no claim about this in the suttas. It doesn't say. However, uh, the scholar Analio has pointed out that there actually are claimed arguments on his behalf in various different traditions in Buddhism. They're in the commentarial tradition in the Theravada, and uh, I believe it's in the Vinaya, and anyway, in a different section in uh, pre-Mahayana uh, Buddhism. So it, it, this argument occurs in different strata and different traditions, so it may indeed be uh, something that we can believe in. In other words, it may go back to the early tradition to begin with. And what this says is that Aritta's argument was that since lay people were able to achieve very high, very high attainments along the path while pursuing sensual pleasures, that therefore there was nothing wrong with sensual pleasures. 
Uh, now, let's back up a bit. What's the, what's the point here? Well, the point is that the Buddha said uh, that lay people, of course, lay people could pursue the path just as much as anybody else could. Lay people are people like perhaps you and certainly me who have families. They may have a wife or a husband. They may have children. They have possessions. They handle money, which uh, monastics are not supposed to do. So they pursue a normal life. They have a normal living. They, they have a, a job and so on. And the Buddha was perfectly happy to say that certain lay people did indeed have very high attainments along the path. And so Aritta's argument seems relatively cut and dried. He's saying, look, lay people can do this and, and achieve high attainments, so, so, so can monastics. So why don't we just do the same thing? Now, the Buddha in this sutta that we've been discussing, the Sutta on the Snake, strenuously disagrees with Aritta. Uh, he chastises Aritta for this, for this argument. Uh, basically, the, the, the point that the Buddha is trying to make is that while lay people can indeed uh, get very far along the path, it's not possible to get all the way to enlightenment according to the Buddha in this text. According to the Buddha, it's not possible to get all the way to enlightenment if you pursue a normal lay life. That is to say, attaining enlightenment is the sort of thing that happens as you're willing to give up many of the sensual pleasures that lay people consider normal. Uh, and that is to say, if, if a lay person does achieve enlightenment, they're going to be having to give up, while they're doing that, a lot of their lay pleasures. It's not that they're going to feel forced to do this, it's just that they're going to go hand in hand. Becoming enlightened means just releasing our tendency to cling to many things that we consider normal in our lives, such as perhaps spouses, families, this kind of thing. We're not going to feel the same attachment, strong emotional bonds that we would otherwise. We're going to feel love and, and kindness and compassion for them, just as we do for everybody, but it's not, we're not going to have the same kind of personal attachments. So this is the Buddha's argument here that, in fact, he says that it's not possible to pursue these kind of sensual pleasures in a way that, that, that doesn't obstruct enlightenment. So this is the background that we should understand when it comes to the parable of the raft. But before we get to that parable, then the Buddha discusses, as I say, a different parable. That is the one about the snake or the metaphor or the simile of the snake. And here, what the Buddha says is that the Dharma, the teachings, the Buddha's teaching, the, the path, the Dharma is like a snake in the sense that if you grasp it incorrectly, it can turn around and bite you and cause you great harm. In other words, you have to grasp the Dharma correctly in order for it to be useful. The Dharma itself is kind of an abstract bunch of uh, claims, views, beliefs, opinions, and they're only useful if understood a certain way. And what does the Buddha say is the incorrect way to grasp the Dharma? The Buddha says that someone grasps the Dharma wrongly when they just memorize the teaching for the sake of finding fault and winning debates. In other words, somebody is understanding the Dharma wrongly if they're simply memorizing it or, or, or getting to know it the way a lawyer might, uh, and that is to say to, to understand, get to know, memorize a bunch of statutes, a bunch of laws, in order to find loopholes, in order to find ways to uh, get around some of the uh, apparent difficulties here uh, so that we can perhaps live the lives we want to live and, and, and do it w following the letter of the, the Dharma without following the spirit of the Dharma. In other words, what we really should be doing is looking at the Dharma as a practice. This is, I think, the most important thing that the Buddha has to say here with the simile of the snake. What he's saying is that the, the Dharma is for, is for practicing. It's not for simply learning in order to have debates, arguments, to be uh, arguing about uh, fine points in order to find loopholes, or we might also say arguing, you know, understanding the Dharma in order to argue with each other about who has the right interpretation, who has the better interpretation, or 
perhaps whose philosophy or whose religion is better than somebody else's. These are incorrect ways to take the Dharma. In other words, to understand it simply as a bunch of, a bunch of views, a bunch of beliefs, a bunch of claims, rather than as a practice to put into practice in our own lives. And it's from here that the Buddha turns to the metaphor, or the parable of the raft. He says, the, therefore, the teaching, the Dharma, is like a raft. And he, he goes on with it. He says, imagine a deluge. There is a flood that is uh, swamping the landscape around you. And you yourself are on a piece of land that is in danger of becoming inundated by this deluge. So what do you do? Well, you look around you, you see that there is a farther shore. There's a place uh, quite in the distance on the other side of this deluge of water that is safe, that it's high ground. And you look around you and you can find, he says, sticks and uh, uh, leaves and grass and other detritus, basically, that you can cobble together into a raft that will help take you across this deluge. Now, I think it's interesting that the Buddha compares the Dharma to a kind of a raft that's cobbled together from miscellaneous stuff that's around you. This does not suggest that the Dharma is necessarily extremely well put together. It's not like a, a fine watch or something that many of us consider the Dharma to be, but rather it's something that's thrown together quickly for a particular purpose. And then he says that when you put, throw this material together, you then you know, sit on top of it, you lie on top of it, you paddle your way across to the farther shore. And that therefore gets you to safety. But then, once you've gotten there, you don't then think to yourself that since this raft has been so helpful to me, this bunch of sticks and leaves that are cobbled together, that I should therefore put them on my head and carry them around with me wherever I go. The Buddha goes on to say, in the same way, I have taught the teaching is similar to a raft. It's for crossing over, not for holding on. By understanding the simile of the raft, you will even give up the teachings, let alone what is against the teachings. So he says you'll even give up the teachings, let alone what's against the teachings. Now, there are a couple of very important points to make about this section here. First of all, when he talks about giving up the teachings, uh, we should recognize that he's largely talking to people who are already enlightened, or just on the verge of becoming enlightened. That is to say, they give up the teachings once they've reached the farther shore. We're not expected to give up the teachings in this respect while we're still in the middle of the deluge. If we do that, we're liable to drown. So there is certainly, even within this parable, even within this simile, there still is the idea that we can cling to the raft while we're in the deluge. Uh, there's some skillfulness to holding on to teachings that are useful to us presently, that we haven't entirely assimilated, shall we say, within us. However, even so, even for those of us who are still paddling in the middle of this deluge, it is good to keep in mind the final point, which is that in the, the broader analysis and the broader understanding, the wiser understanding here, this bunch of sticks and leaves that we're lying down on in the deluge that we're paddling on isn't really the point. The point is to get, get somewhere else with it. The, 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 the raft is not what we're after. What we're after is safety. That's the first point. The second point is that even for people who are enlightened, he's not saying that, they sh that an enlightened person should therefore, if they're giving up uh, the teachings, as he says, he's not therefore claiming that they should somehow become like a Ritta all of a sudden, you know, that they should all of a sudden pursue a lay life uh, far from it. Indeed, the Buddha himself would never have said it, in fact, quite the opposite. And indeed, in several places in the early suttas, it's said that uh, somebody who is enlightened, uh, an arahant is the, is, the, is the Pali word for somebody who is enlightened, that an arahant will never violate, let's say, the precepts. Uh, not because they understand them intellectually and realize they shouldn't do so, 
but because by becoming enlightened, uh, they have given up all interest in doing anything that is unethical in that sense. So the point here is, again, not that somebody enlightened can do anything, but rather the enlightened person, by virtue of being enlightened, is going to stop clinging to the, the Dharma as, as a kind of a fetish, as mine, as something that they are emotionally involved with in the way that one might be emotionally involved with, let's say, a spouse or uh, one's nation, if one's a nationalist or something like that, as something that one has a great deal of identification with, this identification which can cause so much suffering to so many people. Another early sutta makes this point quite clearly, where the Buddha is discussing right view, the the view that understands the Dharma correctly, which is, of course, so, so important on our progress along the path. And indeed, when we, if we ever eventually reach enlightenment, it's so important for enlightenment. And the Buddha says about this right view, he says, pure and bright as this view is, uh, mendicants, that is, monastics, if you cherish it, fancy it, treasure it, and treat it as your own, would you be understanding how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, for crossing over, not for holding on? And the monks say, no, sir. So by holding on to the raft, let's say when we get to the farther shore, the idea of holding on to the raft and putting it on our head, the Buddha here analogizes to cherishing it and clinging to it and, and fetishizing it in a sense, uh, considering it our own as a sort of a possession, holding it over other people's head perhaps. That is, the, that is what the Buddha is saying is a problem that we have to give up, that we have to stop uh, personalizing the Dharma. So in this sense, uh, uh, right view, true beliefs are, are indeed pure and bright like the Buddha is saying, but only insofar as they aid us in this path, only so far as they get us to kindness and compassion and calm, wisdom. If we're going to use these kinds of views or beliefs to foment uh, antagonism between people, if we're going to use them to foment disagreements and arguments and disputes and anger and hatred, then we're not using these views the way they were supposed to be used. We're not using them correctly. We're grasping the snake by the wrong end, if you like. But it's a subtle point, because we also have to keep in mind that the Buddha doesn't therefore mean that we have to be nicey-nice in the kind of cutesy sense of the word. I mean, let's remember that this sutta that we've been discussing, the sutta on the snake, begins with aritta, having wrong view, having a mistaken understanding of the Dharma. And it begins with the monastics and then the Buddha himself uh, very strongly chastising Aritta for this wrong view. So what the Buddha is saying here, I think if we take this whole thing in context, if we take this whole parable in context, is that there, of course, there are times when chastisement is correct. There are times when it is correct to react strongly against somebody who's doing something improper or incorrect. But that it has to be done at the right time and place, it has to be done with the right mindset, with the right heart, a heart of kindness, of, of trying to help somebody rather than trying to hurt them, and so on. Uh, that is the broader idea here that we have to understand while we're letting this Dharma go, while we're letting this this uh, raft go on its own once we've reached that farther shore. So the, 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 the basic question here is what the Buddha had to say about beliefs, about views. Indeed, one of my very earliest videos was a video about just that point, about what the Buddha said about beliefs, about views. And I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen if you want to see more. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, please consider taking a look at my Patreon page. It's linked down below and see if you want to support us. Thanks so much and we'll catch you on the next one. Meanwhile, all of you be well.